But then let's turn to Psalm 57. Uh, and we're going to read the 11 verses of the psalm this morning. Uh, our sermon is taken from the first verse uh, of this uh, psalm. Psalm 57. And we're going to read the 11 verses. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. For my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me into the midst whereof they have fallen themselves. My heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. May the Lord bless to us um, uh, his word as we read it there in uh, the uh, Psalter. The text, as I said, is the first verse of uh, this 57th uh, psalm. Be merciful unto me, O O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. The life of every child of God is marked in uh, some measure by trial and tribulation. And those uh, trials and tribulations uh, come in many shapes and forms. Sometimes the severity of those trials and tribulations is such that they have the potential to overwhelm us. Uh, However, the fact that we uh, suffer trial and tribulation in this life as painful as they may be, the very fact that we suffer those things ought not to surprise us, Uh, nor should we necessarily view those trials and afflictions as an indication of God's disapproval of us or of a lack of love for us. Uh, The sufferings, for example, of Job uh, make that abundantly plain. And also what David uh, declares In Psalm 34 and verse 19, there he says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Uh, The righteous there, of course, refers to those who are justified, those who are vindicated in God's sight uh, through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But yet uh, there the psalmist says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. Uh, Note also the warning that Jesus delivered to his disciples in John 13, John 16 and verse 33. And there Jesus said to his disciples, In the world ye shall suffer tribulation. Uh, Paul, in writing to the Philippians in uh, chapter 1 and verse 29, said this, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. And and one can go through many, many other passages of the scriptures uh, which uh, reveal to us that the uh, child of God uh, 
uh, will in this life unquestionably uh, suffer trial and tribulation. Uh, the frequency of which, with which the child of God uh, encounters those uh, trials and tribulations in this life is, if you're familiar with the Psalms, you would realise is reflected uh, by virtue of the number of times that in the Psalms that you find mention of uh, trouble and affliction and suffering in the life of the psalmist. Uh, many of the psalms, in fact, set forth uh, the distress and anguish of soul experienced uh, by the psalmist. Psalm 57 is such a psalm. In Psalm 57, uh, David describes uh, the depths of his daily struggles that uh, are so uh, trying, so difficult, that they lead him to cry out, Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. And there David, out of the depths of his struggles and pains, clings by faith to him that is invisible. And he embraces his immutable promises and breaks forth ultimately into joyous praise on account of the one who is his refuge and strength. Brethren, in the midst of our trials and tribulations, God is our refuge. That's the comfort and encouragement of this psalm. So if you take nothing else uh, home with you today, take that home. In the midst of our trials and tribulations, God is our refuge. God, in fact, is our hiding place in the midst of our struggles and our pains. Uh, he, is when, he is the one that we need to turn to when we feel that we can't cope, when we feel as though things are as we're overflowing us, overwhelming us. It's at that time that our heartfelt plea, our heartfelt prayer ought to be, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. Why would you and I pray such a prayer? Well, certainly on account of our needs, our great needs, but we would pray that prayer also, as David here declares, for our soul trusts in thee. Our soul, in the innermost depths of our being, we trust in God. And the truth is that in the midst of our greatest trials and tribulations, God is the only one who is actually able to help us. He's the one that we can implicitly trust. And it's in the shadow of his wings that we can find refuge in the midst of the uh, great storms of life. So that's the subject area that we're looking at this morning. Um, uh, God is our refuge. I've entitled our message, uh, really taken from the words of the psalm, in the shadow of his wings, in the shadow of his wings. So look firstly at, at our struggle, secondly our refuge, and then finally our assurance. Uh, though our eyes this morning are going to be focused primarily on the first verse of this uh, psalm, it might just be helpful to provide a brief overview of the whole of the psalm. Uh, in verses 1 through 3, we find David's earnest prayer for God's help, coupled with his absolute confidence that God would actually hear his prayers and be merciful uh, to him. Uh, just very quickly, be merciful unto me, he says, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. That, in a way, is the, is the actual thrust and the essence of the psalm. And that's not uncommon in the psalms where... Uh, Different to how we would write poetry normally, uh, we often, uh, as we work our way to the end, uh, 
and the conclusion comes at the end of our uh, perhaps our poems or our writings. But in the Hebrew, the tendency is to put the uh, conclusion up front, and that's what you find in this psalm. Verses 1 through 3 are really uh, the uh, conclusion of the things that then follow. And what follows in this psalm is that in verses 4 and 6, David goes on to describe the uh, malicious enemies that confronted him. He describes them as those that resemble lions, those whose souls were inflamed and whose teeth were like spears and arrows and who, who sought to ensnare him in their traps. Uh, then in verse 5, in the middle of those, what you find is David gives expression of his desire that in all the events and circumstances of his life, as uh, distressing as they were for him, that God himself might be exalted and honoured and glorified. And uh, in a way, that same uh, theme is found in the last uh, verses of the psalm, verses 7 through 11, because there David also declares his confidence in uh, God, in the fact that God will hear and respond to his prayer, and furthermore, that God will actually be merciful uh, to him. And in light of that, he then lifts up his voice in adoration and praise. Uh, so that's, that's in brief outline uh, the psalm. As I've already mentioned, this is a psalm of David. And the psalm, interestingly and significantly, uh, begins with a double plea on David's part that God will be merciful to him. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. Uh, the repetition of the plea is indicative of the fact that David was in great distress. Uh, he repeats the uh, petition uh, because of the uh, pressure and the stress that was upon him. It's reflective of the, of the depth of his feelings. See, David was bowed down in his soul under the weight of his afflictions. He was at his wit's end. His life was in jeopardy. And though a child of God, and, and David undoubtedly was a child of God, though a child of God, David was struggling with what was occurring in his life. And he is actually, to a measure, filled with anxiety and fear. Uh, we know that sort of anxiety and fear at times in our life, particularly in the midst of great distress. And that's what David was experiencing at this time. And so he turns to the Lord. He turns to his God, uh, the one whom he trusts. You see, there was no one else to whom David could turn. Inherent in David's plea is the implied acknowledgement that he was unable to help himself. What confronted him was beyond him. Uh, men could not help him. David could not help himself. And so he turns to the one whom he trusts, to the only source of help, to the almighty God. And he pleads with God that he would be merciful to him. Uh, to be merciful there means simply really that God will be gracious, that God would uh, show him his loving kindness, that he would... Uh, uh, have uh, pity upon him. Notice the intense personal nature of this uh, prayer or plea. Be merciful unto me, O God, says David. Be merciful unto me. And the question arises, what caused uh, David to cry out in this way for God's mercy? Uh, David's heartfelt pleas uh, stem from what he describes there in verse 1, as these calamities. Be merciful unto me, O God, until, he says, these calamities be overpassed. The Hebrew word translated their calamities highlights the severity and pressing nature of the things that David was enduring at that time. Some consider the Hebrew word translated in the KJV calamities as referring to storms of destruction. So the essence of David's plea here is, Be merciful unto me, O God, until these storms of destruction 
uh, be overpassed. And I think that's uh, not an unreasonable uh, translation of the, the idea of calamities as it is, appears in the Hebrew language. That incidentally is how the English Standard Version translates uh, that word. It's also how the Revised Standard Version translates the Hebrew. The idea being that David was enduring a series of storms that threatened to destroy him. Storm after storm, trial after trial, affliction after affliction breaking over him. So it seemed as though there was no end to the trouble and the strife that he was enduring. And brethren, perhaps we can relate to that as well. In fact, I, I suspect all of us at different times in our life can very, very uh, really relate uh, to such a situation. Times when we're confronted and assailed with one issue after another, no sooner do we seem to have addressed one issue than another arises. And so there seems to be no end of the troubles. And after a continuous pummeling, uh, we, we feel as though we simply can't endure, we can't press on, it's all too much for us. And that, that's really the feelings that David had here which caused him to pen this psalm. It's perhaps also worth adding that the, the Hebrew word uh, translated in the KJV, calamities, also uh, carries with it uh, another idea in the Hebrew. And that's also probably valid here as well to take into consideration. Uh, the Hebrew word also carries with it the idea of a gulf or a chasm, uh, something that cannot be traversed. And the idea is that these gulfs or chasms uh, appear across the path of David. And they're, they're such, uh, of such depth and such width that he simply cannot uh, traverse them. Any attempt to do so would inevitably lead to destruction. And when you take those thoughts into, into account, the idea here then would be that, God, that David is also pleading with the Lord that God will be merciful so as to enable him to pass over such gulfs and chasms that impeded his way and threatened his destruction. Uh, you see, for David, there appeared to be no way forward, uh, no way that he could overcome these issues, and uh, yet they uh, threatened his very existence. Uh, whichever, as it were, if one combines the thoughts about what the uh, word calamities means, uh, we're not mistaken, though, as to the essential nature of these calamities. Uh, these uh, calamities refer to some specific events and circumstances in the life of David that were highly troublesome uh, and indeed uh, actually threatened his very life. Uh, uh, the calamities of which he speaks here were actually matters that concerned life and death. Uh, can we say something more about these calamities? Yes, we can. Uh, the heading of this psalm actually affords us some insight into the nature of the specific calamities uh, that confronted David at this time. The heading of the psalm reads uh, to the chief musician, uh, Altakis, a victim of David when he fled from, the, uh, from Saul in the cave. Now, I don't propose to go into the meaning of all of those words. Indeed, some of the words there in the heading, the meaning of them are actually uncertain. Uh, but what is of significance to us is the description there, the uh, conclusion of the heading, uh, that this psalm was written when uh, David fled from Saul in the cave. Um, uh, if you're familiar with the uh, life of David, uh, uh, you would know that there are actually two instances uh, in David's life that fit the description uh, when he fled from Saul in the cave. Uh, the first is recorded in 1 Samuel 22, uh, where David took refuge in the cave of Abdullam. Now, the second, which is probably better known, is the one that we read this morning in 1 Samuel 24 and involved the cave at En Gedi. Uh, it's unnecessary and, in fact, not possible to determine which of the two incidents is actually referenced by the heading of Psalm 57. Uh, what is significant, though, is the two incidents... Uh, the one in uh, 1 Samuel 22 and the one in 1 Samuel 24 stand in close 
chronological connection uh, to one another. And what is obvious is at the time that David penned this psalm, uh, he was the object of Saul's bitter hatred and ongoing murderous intent. Now, perhaps to appreciate the gravity of David's situation uh, and the significance of the cave at Adullam and also the cave at Engedi, it might be uh, helpful to just briefly reflect on the events of David's life uh, that lead up to his presence in the cave at Adullam and also at the cave of Engedi. Uh, so we just quickly trace back a little over the life of uh, David, if you wanted to uh, read of that, if you would, if you went back, uh, perhaps even today, and were to read from First Samuel 15 through to probably First Samuel 26, uh, it's those chapters of the scriptures cover uh, the these events in the life of uh, Saul and David. You recall that when David was only a very young man, minding in fact at the time his father's sheep that God had rejected Saul from being king over Israel. And God rejected Saul from being king over Israel on account of Saul's disobedience. You read of that in 1 Samuel 15. And shortly after uh, the rejection of Saul as king, uh, Samuel was directed by the Lord to go and to anoint uh, David, uh, though he, he was at that time still a very young man, uh, Samuel was directed to go and anoint David to be uh, the next king over Israel. Uh, following his anointing, uh, David did not immediately, of course, ascend to the throne of Israel. Saul continued in that role. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, David was anointed to be the next king. David himself, uh, following his anointing, actually returned to the uh, tending of his father's flock and it was there in those ensuing months and years, in fact, that the Spirit of God began to qualify him for his future office as king. Saul, though, following the communication of God's rejection by him, by Samuel, actually fell into deep depression. And the, in the providence of God, David, who was actually a skilled musician, was the one that was actually called uh, to come and to play music for Saul in order to soothe his troubled soul. Uh, David did that, and he did it successfully, uh, with the result that David actually gained favour uh, with Saul. And when Saul's depression abated, uh, David actually then returned uh, to the caring of his father's flock. As you read on in First Samuel, the uh, next time that we... Uh, come across David is when uh, Saul uh, and the army of Israel is actually battling uh, the Philistines. Uh, it's there that uh, Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, comes forth, blasphemes the name of God and challenges the Israelites to send out a man to fight him. But the men of Israel, Saul included, uh, were not willing to take up that challenge. And uh, it is then that, as you would well know, David comes uh, to visit his brothers who are part of the army of Israel. And he comes and he actually takes up the challenge. Though still a very young man, uh, he is uh, highly affronted uh, by the blasphemy of uh, Goliath. And uh, he, uh, in fact, comes and in the name of the Lord of hosts goes out uh, to confront uh, Goliath, and then you have the events of David's slaying of Goliath uh, with the sling and with the stones. David's uh, victory over Goliath uh, was uh, something that attracted uh, the accolades of the people, uh, but that caused a rift to develop between David and Saul. Uh, Saul was highly affronted uh, that David should be viewed in such high esteem uh, by the people. And so in the uh, ensuing chapters there, 1 Samuel 18, you read of two occasions in which uh, Saul actually sought to take David's life uh, by throwing his javelin uh, at him. You have other instances also there in uh, 1 Samuel 18 
of attempts on the part of Saul to uh, kill David. Uh, you might recall that uh, at one stage uh, Saul promised uh, to give uh, Mishael uh, to David to wife, uh, but one of the requirements that he had for, as it were, a dowry was that uh, David had to present him uh, 100 foreskins of the Philistines uh, in order that he might marry uh, Mishael. Now, David, uh, Saul's plan there was, in fact, that uh, David uh, would, in fact, uh, seek to fulfil that requirement uh, but die in the process. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Saul's, fan, Saul's uh, plan uh, for David's death in that way failed. Uh, but then you find that the hatred of Saul for David doesn't abate, but in fact it increases. First Samuel 19, uh, in the very first verse of that chapter, you read, And Saul spake to Jonathan his son and to all his servants that they should kill uh, David. And so this hatred of David, this pursuit of David, is ongoing. Uh, David, of course, is uh, helped uh, by Jonathan. Jonathan uh, uh, engineers David's escape, in fact, uh, from Jerusalem, but Saul still continues to pursue him. Uh, you then have uh, that account of, uh, of David going to Nob and to Ahimelech, the priest there. The, uh, Ahimelech gives to him the, uh, bread from the, show, the uh, bread from the table of showbread, gives him also the uh, sword of Goliath, and uh, the result of that was, of course, that Ahimelech, who was unaware of the uh, uh, tensions between David and Saul, Ahimelech and the priests of Nob, and indeed all the citizens of Nob, are actually slain uh, by Saul because of the help that they rendered uh, to David. Uh, and then you, if you follow on the account from Nob, uh, David then flees to Gath in Philistia. And there he feigns, in fact, madness in order to preserve himself from the rage of the Philistines over the death of Goliath. And from Gath, uh, so David's fleeing from place to place. And from Gath, David then makes his way. And here we come to uh, what's perhaps more relevant to us this morning. He comes from Gath to the cave of Abdullam. And he goes to the cave of Abdullam because, again, he's seeking uh, to find a place of refuge as Saul continues to pursue him from place to place. We're told that at the cave of Abdullam, if you read in 1 Samuel 22, you'll find that at the cave of Abdullam, his brethren and all his father's house uh, came out to meet him. They numbered about 400 men, and they promised to stand by uh, David. And from Abdullam, David then goes to a place called Kila, or a city called Kila, and there he defeats the Philistines that are actually pillaging that city. Uh, and perhaps he thinks he might find refuge there, but there's no refuge to be found in Kila because the Lord warns David that the men of Kila will actually deliver him into the hands of Saul. And so David flees also from Kila, and he goes then into the wilderness of Ziph, uh, but there's no refuge there in Ziph either, uh, uh, in the wilderness of Ziph, because the Ziphites actually informed uh, Saul of David's whereabouts, and Saul comes with his army in search of David. And that forces David then to seek refuge in the wilderness of Maon. Uh, and, and that was a part, what, part of what we read this morning, where in fact David was uh, almost captured by Saul in the uh, wilderness of Maon and would have in fact been captured except the Philistines uh, intruded into the land of Israel. And so Saul was forced to go and address the incursion of the Philistines and David was enabled again to escape. Uh, David then leaves the wilderness of Maon and he makes his way to the desert of en uh, where he actually lodged in a cave. And then you have that very, very interesting account of how that uh, Saul with some 3,000 men comes seeking David among the caves of en -Gedi. And in 1 Samuel 24, you have the record of how that Saul enters actually into the very cave uh, where David and his men were actually hiding. And Saul goes in there to relieve himself, and so he's vulnerable. Uh, David's men, seeing Saul there in such a vulnerable state, uh, urge him to rid himself of Saul. They say to him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy 
into thine hand that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Uh, but David won't touch uh, Saul. Uh, David refuses, he says, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed. I won't stretch forth mine hand against uh, him because he is the Lord's anointed. What David does, in fact, as we read, he cut off a portion of uh, the robe of Saul to evidence that he had actually spared the life of Saul. And when that was revealed subsequently to Saul, we find that Saul actually confesses his guilt. He says to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded the evil. And what we find is that then uh, Saul then leaves off, for that time at least, the pursuit of David. Uh, Saul returns home. That was not the end of it. If you read on in 1 Samuel, uh, 1 Samuel 26, you read again of how the the Ziphites, uh, the malicious Ziphites, uh, seek to ingratiate themselves with Saul and they inform him, in fact, now that David is holed up in the hill of Hikalah or Hakalah. What does Saul do? Uh, Saul gathers his men again and out he goes uh, seeking uh, David there in the hill of Hakalah. He does so with murderous intent. But again, the Lord delivers uh, David. In fact, uh, David, at one stage uh, when uh, Saul is seeking him, um, the uh, Saul's camp, uh, he enters into Saul's camp at night and uh, again, he had the opportunity to kill uh, Saul because all of Saul's soldiers are asleep. But David doesn't uh, kill him, but he does carry away Saul's spear and his water pot again uh, to demonstrate that he had no design on the life of Saul. When that's revealed again to Saul, we find that Saul repents. And again in First Samuel twenty six twenty one, you read, And Saul said, I have sinned, return my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day, because I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. And we find then that Saul again uh, returns home. But that was not the end of it either. Throughout the whole of the life of Saul, uh, he continually sought the life of David. So what you have there in that is the description of, of what it is, is, is uh, what these calamities really are for David. And in essence, the calamities of David was that his, uh, from his youth, from his very young age, Saul, uh, over months, in fact years, years, year after year, Saul is actually seeking his life and he's actually actively, actively pursuing uh, the life of David. Uh, So what did that mean for David? This is really, I guess, the heart of Psalm 57. It meant David was a fugitive. He was a fugitive. He was constantly uh, going from place to place, seeking refuge in this place, and then being forced to move on as Saul came uh, looking for him. He's really hunted effectively like a wild animal. And the, and the interesting thing is it's all without justification. There's no justification for Saul's seeking of the life of David. David, in fact, in the course of uh, his dealings with Saul, had proven to be a significant help uh, to Saul. Uh, but that's all uh, forgotten. Saul's just simply enraged by the, the uh, sense of the, uh, the accolades and the approval uh, that David received from the people and, and also a, a, a realisation that David, in fact, is to be the next king of Israel. And so uh, David is forced to flee from place to place, from cave to cave, from forest to forest. There are very few that he could actually trust he separated from his family. He actually knew very little of the material comforts of this life. In fact, you read in different instances uh, how he struggled uh, to find food for himself and for his men. And the difficulties and trials that David experienced and which really form these calamities of which he speaks uh, 
actually reflected in the descriptions of his enemies that you find in this psalm. Uh, we won't go into them in any detail, but notice in verse 3 uh, that he speaks about those that are seeking to swallow him up. He goes on to describe them in verse 4 as lions, that is, as those who uh, are fierce and savage. Uh, they are men he describes as being set on fire, that is, they are men who are actually inflamed against him. Uh, such was their hatred. He even says there how that when he laid down at night, uh, when he sought rest, uh, it was as though he was surrounded by these enemies. So the indication there is these, these are the things that are playing on his mind. These are not just necessarily literal things, but uh, these are the things that are, are occupying uh, his mind night and day. And so understandably, uh, given the severity of the afflictions that David was experiencing and had experienced over a long period of time. Uh, he cries out, Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. Undoubtedly, David's life was a struggle. But so too is the life of every child of God. What David experienced reflects our life, reflects your life, reflects my life. Every believer experiences calamities in one form or another. Our calamities uh, may not be as great as those encountered uh, by David. Uh, they may not mean that we have to continually flee from place to place. But nonetheless, our calamities are just as real. They're just as real. And in fact, in some instances, perhaps even our calamities might even be greater than those that David experienced. Uh, what we find is that the storms of destruction actually break over us. And those storms are destructive of our peace and our contentment. And we feel the pressure of those storms. And they have the potential to cower us and to generate within us anxiety and fear, just as they did in David's life. And perhaps they're so over overwhelming that they cause us to question, uh, does God really love us? Does God care uh, for me? Uh, these are calamities that actually have the potential to challenge our faith, to drive us into despair, to crush our spirits. And at times, as it was with Dave, there seems to be no end to them. One storm after another, what, what are we to do? What are we to do when faced with such calamities, with such storms of destruction? Brethren, what we need to do is what David did. We need to cry out unto the Lord. We need to cling to God the God of our salvation. We need to cling to Jesus Christ. We need to cry out unto God for his mercy. That David's uh, plea should be our plea. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. When you think about it, where else, where else are we going to turn? Where else are we going to find the help that we need. Uh, who can address the uh, great uh, problems and issues that we are facing in our lives? The truth is we can't help ourselves. Uh, the, the, the ability of men to help us is also exceedingly limited. Brethren, our help is in the Lord. And that's why David did what he did. Uh, he saw that his help was in the Lord. As he says in this first verse, my soul trusteth in thee. David trusted in God. When no one else could be trusted, God could be trusted. In the most pressing and trying circumstances of life, God 
could be trusted. Is that how we see uh, the Lord? Is that how we view him? Is it, do we actually have that measure of trust when everything else is seemingly hopeless? Do we put our trust in him? David did. And David here tells us, in fact, that he sought refuge under God's protective wings. Hey, moreover, he says, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge. In the midst of his calamities, David actually sought to draw ever nearer to God, to bring himself under his wings, bring himself under those wings where he was assured of protection and safety. So refuge from the storms of destruction under the shadow of God's wings. Uh, the metaphor employed here uh, causes us to think of the mother hen that covers and protects her young under her wings when danger looms. In the face of danger, the young chicks scurry to their mother who nestles them under her wings. And her wings then provide that protective canopy for her young just as the shadow affords protection from the heat of the sun. And that is what David did when confronted by the storms of destruction that uh, sought to envelop him. David sought the protection and help of God. You know, it's not difficult to imagine how that David would have uh, fervently sought God uh, to have mercy upon him because there were times uh, when it all appeared almost uh, completely uh, a lost cause for him. Can you imagine what it was like for him there in the uh, wilderness of Maon when Saul with 3,000 men, actually the Bible describes them as 3,000 chosen men. So these are the elite soldiers uh, in the nation of Israel. And they have 3,000 of them, and they're actually encircling David uh, there in the wilderness of Maon. And, and it's almost certain that he simply can't escape. You can, you can imagine how David, in the midst of those circumstances, when all appeared lost, uh, would, would have been led uh, to actually uh, seek the Lord, uh, have mercy upon thee. Brethren, sometimes we feel that way too. We feel uh, that there's just no no hope, no help. Um, it may be that the calamities that we're facing, the storms of destruction, they're not physical enemies necessarily that are coming to uh, take our life, but the problems and the trials that we're facing are just as real and they're, they're imposing themselves on us and our life, and we don't think we can't see the way out of the problems. It's interesting in that instance, of course, of the uh, wilderness of uh, Maon, that God actually did provide uh, David with the protection. Uh, he sends the Philistines, and uh, they uh, force uh, Saul uh, to abandon the pursuit of David and to go and to deal with them. How do we do that? How do, how do we actually uh, bring our souls under the uh, protection of God's wings? Uh, how do we find refuge under those wings? I think in short, we could say it's by faith and by prayer. Like David, we need to trust in God. We need to believe that he is God uh, and moreover we need to believe that he's our God. The God of our salvation. The God of our salvation in and through Jesus Christ. Uh, to believe that of course is a work of God's grace. 
But in embracing that truth that he is our God, we need to look away from self. Uh, We need to put our trust genuinely in the Lord. Uh, We need to trust his word. We need to have confidence in what he says. We need to embrace his promises. Uh, Promises such as uh, some of us actually looked at on uh, Wednesday evening. Promises such as you find in Isaiah Uh, 40, verses 29 through 31, where Isaiah says, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they notice this, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Do we believe that? Do we believe that? That as we wait upon the Lord, that he will renew our strength, that we'll be enabled to mount up with wings as eagles, run, not be weary, walk, not faint? Well, what about the promises of uh, God in Isaiah 43? This is really 1 through 7, but just for our purposes this morning, 1 and 2. But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. By thy name thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And uh, through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest uh, through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. But what about the uh, promises of God Contained in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, we can keep going and uh, uh, set forth promise after promise of the word of God. Uh, That's how, in part, brethren, we bring ourselves under uh, the protective wings of God. We trust him. We trust his promises. Uh, The uh, second aspect, I think, of our bringing ourselves under the wings of God is what's uh, clearly set forth before us in this psalm. We need to be a praying people. Uh, Like David, we need to be fervent in prayer. Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me. We need to confide in the Lord. We need to bring before him all our anxieties and fears. Uh, We, in the words of Uh, Philippians, Paul and Philippians, we need to let our requests be made known unto God and we need to plead for that peace of God which passes all understanding, which is able to keep or to guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That's the remedy. That's the remedy for our anxiety and fear. Brother, notice that David's prayer uh, is that God will be merciful to him and allow him to find refuge under his wings until these calamities be overpassed, until these storms of destruction be passed by or the the chasms or the uh, gaps that confront him on the road that he walks until those uh, chasms are are able to be traversed. David, it would seem, was persuaded that the storms of destruction would, uh, for him, would eventually cease, that there would come a time when he was no longer forced to flee from place to place. He'd no longer be in fear of his life. But until that time came, 
until the danger was past, uh, what he tells us here is that he would continually seek refuge under the wings of God. Because under those wings there was an assurance of safety. When David uttered this uh, prayer, uh, he had actually no idea when the storms of destruction raging around him would actually have come to an end. Uh, by this time, those storms, as I already mentioned, had been raging uh, for years. Uh, uh, and David had no uh, certainty that those calamities uh, would actually come to an end, certainly not quickly. Uh, even though Saul, as I've already mentioned, at least on two occasions, confessed his sin in unjustly seeking the death of David, uh, that did not mean that Saul stopped pursuing him altogether. Now the storms continued. And that can also be our experience as well in life. And David declares here, declares here yet, yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. It should not be taken as indicating that all of the storms of destruction that we encounter in this life will necessarily pass by. Uh, sometimes in the providence of God, those storms endure. And perhaps they endure for a time, but perhaps they also endure for a lifetime. Uh, you see examples of that in the scripture. Paul sworn in the flesh, I think, is an example of that. Um, but what should we take from what uh, David is saying here? David's point here, I believe, is this, that as long as those storms of destruction endure, and even if those storms of destruction endure for a long time and perhaps even for a lifetime, our safety and our protection is actually still to be found under the shadow of God's wings. But that's where our safety and our protection is to be found. And it's to be found there whether the calamities that confront us are of short duration or of long duration. And so, brethren, let us cry out with David as we deal with the calamities, with the storms of destruction that confront us. Let us cry out with David, Be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Amen. Let's uh, stand for a brief uh, word of prayer.